What's up, everybody? It's Joe LaPuma. You're watching. You are listening. The Complex Sneaker Show. I'm not with my guys in the studio. I'm remote. I have a producer in L.A., super producer Dave Matthews. Uh, our to my producer right. Dave but Matthews is with you. You're hanging out with him early he is. on the West Coast he morning? Is. He is. He got his uh, ear pods in with the cords. He tried to get me to wear his <laughs> ear pods. I said, absolutely not. And then he offered to have me wear the airline ear pods. I said, absolutely not. But they got me right. <laughs> did he Did he pour Did he pour a, a little bit of Mountain Dew in an espresso glass for you? He has the Mountain Dew. He, he has the Mountain Dew right in turn front the, of him. Turn, Code turn the YouTube on. Code Red. Code <laughs> oh Red. Oh, my God. This is, it's 717. Oh, it's my 717 God. It's 717 in the morning. You can't uh, put it in. Uh, number on marketing, right? You just gave Mountain Dew. Yeah, free ads. Yep. There we go. <laughs> Big sponsor for 2024? <laughs> yeah, listen, we'll take it. Right in front of me, though, Mr. Matt Welty. Where in the world is Joe LaPuma? I'm in L.A. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Little, it tailed off. It tailed off. And then, again, right in front of me, to my right in front of me, Mr. Brendan Dunn. How we doing? Hello, hello. I'm doing well. Glad that we're kind of back together. It feels like we've been away for so long, and then we, we launched the Complex Con episode, and that was late, but we're going to do a lot of catching up today, and I'm happy that at least in some way we're together. And it feels long. It feels yes. long, right? It, it doesn't feel like we were together, what, two weeks ago? Was it two weeks ago or three weeks ago? It, it feels like months ago. By the way, I also want to – I always do these PSAs of turning the YouTube on now yeah. if you're listening to this. Definitely you should have turned the video on already if you're listening because you, you would have seen off camera the, the Mountain Dew yeah. – fly into the shot so dave matthews yes. really is drinking code red at 7 a.m speaking of complex con please i heard you got a special pair of sneakers there um where'd you hear that what from you you got, you, you got a pair of air force ones yes i did buy yeah. the mushroom oh. nike air force one this is a grail for me people i'm sure y'all get asked all the time like what's your grail pair of sneakers and for me i usually can't really come mm -hmm. up with the answers and sometimes when i when i'm sitting in bed at like 2 a.m and i'll you know, bolt awake and be like, that's what, that's it. That's the shoe I was that, thinking about. That's, that's, that's the one that's that what you think about at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, that's what wakes kinda. you up out of your sleep. Yeah, kind of. And, you know, I try and really tuck them away in my brain so I can remember when people ask me, you know, stuff like yeah. the New Balance MT580 flight jacket pack. Mm. That's a grail for me mm. for sure. But Mushroom Nike Air Force Ones, a big time grail, a big, can we say it? Brendan Dunn shoe. Brendan Dunn shoe. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> Not has there the same go. traction as the JLP shoes. But yeah, uh, Riff at ComplexCon. This sounds like a ComplexCon advertisement. It's totally not. This really happened. Riff had a booth there, and they were selling a bunch of old, hard-to-find, dead stock sneakers, and there were some mm -hmm. raffles involved, and they did let me come in and, and buy a pair. Rather cheap. I got them for 100 bucks. Size 10, dead stock, crispy, Ooh. mushroom Nike Air Force Are One. A shoe that, what's up? Are they wearable? Um... We'll have to go to our friend Abdul and really ask him whether or not he feels like a sneaker from that long ago in Air Force One particularly is wearable. I make sure he gets the uh, magnifying glass out, well, you know? <laughs> it's, we it's weird because Air Jordan 1s and Dunks are presumably wearable all, all the time. Right. The Those will hold up OGs, well. But people will think that Air Force 1s fall into the same category because the sole just looks thicker. Right. But... The air pocket in the heel, even though you normally don't think – you don't really associate Air Force Ones with actually having air. Because they don't have the visible air. Yes, in them. But the air pocket tends to deflate over time. And yeah. you see these Air Force Ones that have, like, this saggy, like, bulge on yeah. the side of it. and It just looks, looks like a big blister, right? Yeah. Actually, my – stash nike air force ones i think the bubble in those popped and so the side is bulging out a bit but um mm. i was talking to abdul about the mushroom air force ones when we were at complex con and he showed me a website where you can buy replacement air force one sole units do we consider that it, it's not sanctioned by nike and then you, does someone do it for you or you send them to them i think you buy the sole units and then you still have to find somebody to attach them are we doing that or is that considered fake sneakers you know in tech class did you guys ever have to do the stool in tech class where you take you, you make the a stool, stool like, like with, fecal matter? No, like a, a step stool with the wood. No, you that you was were the building, big project. You were building Everyone stools had, in shop? Yes, shop class, exactly. I was the worst one. I would never, ever <laughs> even attempt to resole anything. The worst one. But would you do it on principle or would you feel it was fake if you were buying a third party sole that looked exactly like a Nike Air Force One sole and having somebody attach it to a legit pair? We've talked about this before. I think there's certain classics like that mm -hmm. that i would maybe resole but i think knowing me i probably wouldn't go through the process 
I had this like this like realization. It's funny because we debate these things endlessly on here. I'm not saying that they don't matter. And yeah. it's like it's so funny that we put so much time, thought, and effort into these uh, hypothetical situations. That if I get this Grail shoe that mm-hmm. I want, and I get I can't wear it because the sole unit is blown out and at the end of the day walking around in that is going to maybe be uncomfortable it may even be i don't want to say dangerous but there's like you know if like the soles like saggy in the back like you may you end up on the train and half your shoe is gone yeah so we're worried about this hypothetical that if we get our grail shoe and then we wear it on our talk show or we post on the internet that people are going to be mad at us that we did the wrong thing uh, Who per said se. that? No, but it's <laughs> are just you like, worried, Joe? But it's just like the sort of like Dang. thought. It's the sort of thought process you have of like, can I do this or can I do this? Yeah, right. But the reality of anyone in your actual day to day or anyone you encounter in the real world outside criticizing you for replacing the Air Force One the sole on your Grail Air Force Ones is basically non-existent. And if there is someone out there, you know what? F them. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think it's about the criticism more so than the process. For me, it's about the principle, just me knowing myself. It's the same thing when, and we talk about it so much, and I don't want to get into a big, long fake sneakers conversation, but that, like, nobody would ever know if I was wearing fake sneakers. But for me, personally, I wouldn't do it just because of what I think of as the principles of sneaker collecting as a hobby. Fair enough. A principled man. Joe at Complex Con. We shot the episode Tony for now. Go watch it now, literally. Nice. Uh, you know, we have like the little the little intro where you have a little something on your wrist. Uh this week. Are you gonna bring up a comment? <laughs> what are we no. ta- what are we talking no, about? This is a segue. This is a segue, Joe. Uh Travis Scott had a Audemars, oh, yeah. had an Audemars Peugeot collaboration launch, two hundred limit wa- limited watches, also a whole merch line. To go yeah. along with it, did you did you get the watch? You you know what? You better relax today. You better relax. <laughs> he thinks that just because you're on the West Coast, he can get yeah, this spicy. Yeah, don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. I still back got jet blue. Mint I got people ASAP. in that studio. I got people in that studio remotely. Don't worry about it. We're, no, we're, I didn't get the watch. But did you see the CEO mic drop retire? <laughs> the <AP> CEO. <laughs> and then he played, and then Travis played Fiend, and Travis just looks at him. Did you see that moment? Yeah. That's how we need. Did you do that on the last episode of FSR? <laughs> That's how you have to do that. To FSR sicko series mode. finale Wealthy's, coming soon. Well, exactly. Wealthy's favorite song. You just yep. drop the mics. You kick over the <laughs> kick over the table in sicko mode place. That's how the CEO went out. Stroll wow. off the set in my half fake mushroom Air Force ones with Your the brand new <laughs> crispy white sole on them. Is PG Nose gonna get uh, AP to resell though? I'm wondering if he's gonna get one of the 200. You know, he Much. got the Kith BMW. Oh. <laughs> didn't he resell the? <laughs> didn't he resell the Kith BMW? So I may, possibly. Where do you maybe. store that if if you have it on deck for the flip? And can know. you list that on Ger- stock eggs? Jer- you, I think you can. Jersey City, you got the you garage. Drive, drive it straight to the smot, the are, moon. Are, are, yeah. Are you, are you more excited about the the Kith Chips Ahoy uh, ice cream sandwiches launching for Kith? What about the popcorn machine, though? I'm I'm uh, sorry, I wasn't made aware of either of these things. I did not get the press release. Are we gonna do a secret Santa us three, and I'll, maybe I'll get you the the Kith popcorn machine? <laughs> Wealthy, you you getting coal? We should do it. We should do a. a Secret Santa situation with the fans of the Complex Sneakers show. What do you think? A big group one in Discord or something like that? Sure, I have not, organize I am, it. I am not doing a Discord. <laughs> That's one thing I have never been on. And no, I no, am, no. Same. I have no plans of even uh, getting anywhere near it. No, absolutely not. You know what you could get me for the Secret Santa, though? I, I spotted a pair of shoes today on set that I really want. And this is classic. Well, he's going to tell me I, I won't wear them. Joe, Matthew Butler was wearing oh. the... Triple black Nike Air Foam Posit Ones. And there's a new pair coming out in 2023. And that's a shoe that a previous version of Brendan Dunn probably wouldn't have thought about too much. But I don't know if I'm just like stuck in this foam zone right now and excited about the retros. But wow, I could I could do a pair, I think, of triple black foams. I don't know. <laughs> I feel I, I feel like speaking of triple black foams, Joe, I feel like did didn't you get excited about was it twenty four? 15 when they did the triple black foam posit but it was like the suede pair didn't you end up getting I those wo- back then you I, I wore them a- the suede pair i wore them a lot with the like the, the new buck style like what 
don't act like that's not a like a big JLP shoe. JLP, come on, what's wrong with that? What because okay. why do we need that on foams? They're foam posits. Maybe a little men's weary. Is that what you're trying to say? I just feel like that sort of soft material has no place on a foam. Well, listen. We wanted bulletproof. I got threatened, we wanted I got, Teflon. Yeah, I got threatened over the Galaxy foam posits, so <laughs> I think it evened out. You okay? paid your debts. <laughs> yeah. You can wear whatever foams but, uh, you want. But yeah, wealthy. That was. Tr- I wore those a bunch. You know, black suede foams. Yeah. We'll but see why how would that you, age. why would you get those over the regular black foams? Were they out at the time? I think there was a pair of wealthy in 2012 with the clear sole, the stealth foams. Well, that was. This was years later. That was yeah, a few years after. Okay. This was like after the initial. Not the initial foam hype, but that classic foam yeah, posit that, that era wave that, that around two thousand twelve. The Nike basketball era. Here's the thing that I would tell you guys. Okay. I will never probably wear another pair of foams. Wait, why? Uh I don't I just don't think they would look good on me right now. How many foams do you have in the closet? I got a bunch. I mean maybe which I don't even know what shorts. I have the Supreme foams. I have the Galaxy foams. C D G foams? I have I have the C D Oh, C D G foams. Maybe I would bring those back out. You're ready to retire all your Nike Air foam posits? I think so. And I love the shoe. Just doesn't work with what you're trying to do in 2023 and 2024 and beyond. I don't think so. I don't think so, but I could change my mind. But I don't see I – would, I would predict that you guys don't see me in, in those. Should we officially take them off the big JLP shoe list? You, you guys look so so uh, taken back at the revelation. <laughs> 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 the, Dropping the bomb energy, cells on this the, week's podcast. Yeah, the energy, the energy is yeah. palpable of the breaking news. <laughs> we'll get the ticker going at the bottom. Exactly. Wow. <laughs> Nike exactly. cannot be reached for comment. Joel of Puma ditches phone pauses for the future. <laughs> exactly. All the other blogs don't rush to the yeah. to the back end. You know. <laughs> Ma- mainstream-ish, uh, non non sneaker culture things that I uh, saw um, recently. I know. I, sh- I think I showed you. Showed you this the other day, Brendan. I just want to tie this into something else. There was a Instagram reel that I saw about it was it was a joke. Um, yes, play, I'm glad you brought this up. You play, were mad about this. Playing a, playing off the samba trend and how popular sambas are now, right? And it's okay. a and it's a joke about a guy going on a first date with a, a blind date with a girl, and um, she's presumably in some sort of Dime Square esque New York City location. And it, the joke is. If you show up to the date and she has sambas on, he walks away before he even says hi because he's saving himself from going on a date with the samba girl, right? That's wow, like, that many that many words, or that's the <laughs> sorry th- that that's the premise, and they zoom in on her feet in the thing, and this thing has like ninety thousand likes on Instagram, mm-hmm. and they go when she's wearing sambas and she's wearing the handball speciales, and I'm like, man. <laughs> You made a whole meme about not wanting to date a girl who wears sambas, yeah. and now she's wearing actually wearing the other Adidas shoe that's not even the samba. But looks vaguely like a samba for the uninitiated. And it's funny because back when I was super heavy on those shoes, mm-hmm. you couldn't even buy those shoes in the United States. Like, they just didn't sell them. And now The handball spezia. Yeah. Yes. And now they're such just like a ubiquitous shoe that they've become like a meme on the internet. Well, you know... I don't know if you guys know um, Uncut Gems. Mike Francesa has an amazing cameo in it. Mm-hmm. And he goes like this. He leans in to Adam Sandler. He goes, I disagree. I disagree. There's nothing wrong with the Sambas. And there's nothing, you know, Wealthy, I can see that you feel a way about the special, the handball specials in internet meme fodder. But there's nothing wrong with the Sambas. I agree all. that there's nothing wrong with the Sambas. But I feel like... It shows how far the shoe has gone into the mainstream. And it's always been a mainstream shoe. It was yeah, never yeah. a niche shoe, but it's such a thing right now, such yeah. a meme right now, that the people who want to make memes about it have no vague knowledge of, of what a Steven shoe is. Really. Yeah, of, of what the model really looks like on a detailed level because they're mistaking this other shoe for a Samba. Well, there was also, you know, because we saw the Samba last week, or was Bjorn Golden, uh, CEO mm. of Adidas, uh, when that shoe got labeled as the Footwear News uh, shoe of the year, right, and he spicy kind of lauding that as you know the the biggest thing that Adidas has going on, or one yeah. of them, and there's all this hype built off of it. And then I feel like there was a lot of discussion on the internet, people debating, wait, are Sambas a popular shoe? What? What? People wait, were debating what? that? Yeah, they're like, wait, I, I don't see anyone wear those. What? No, I saw- that's uh, I I didn't Cap. see that, but I will say like, <laughs> I will say that. I'll be in in Brooklyn walking, and it's like groups 
of women wearing sambas. Like, there will be a group of five, and, it, like, three of them will have it on. Same colorway? Yeah, to be honest, the last a, a few weeks ago, like I, I saw it, and it was actually the regular one, the black and white one, yeah. not like even the fashionable ones. But how can you debate that's a popular shoe? I feel like the samba, though, it may be much more of like a regional thing, where it's like we're in New York City, and it's such a thing in New York City. But when you're talking about people on the internet, it's not everyone who's exposed to the same things that you are. So maybe someone in Houston who maybe not doesn't see go out and see just one, like the the samba becoming a new panda dunk might mm-hmm. be like what are you talking about i don't see that yeah. you know well i guess there is the thing of adidas cleaning up the marketplace with the samba a little bit and i spoke to an adidas exec about this yeah. last week where he was saying that they did make a real effort to get rid of some of the pairs that were out there a lot what they did to the stan smith exactly pre- clean it up before yeah. they really reintroduce it in a big way so so there's not like the there's like when sometimes there might be like a uh, different version of the shoe where like yeah. the the production's a little different and they don't want those pairs getting conflated with the current yeah. pairs. Make the shoe special again before you really pump it out. So maybe we're just on the cusp of what Samba will become. But we're, we're Make also- Make the Samba great again is yeah. what you're saying? <laughs> no, but so- <laughs> There's what, the clip. <laughs> what, it's funny, so I bring, tie that back to Handball Special, and I said that it's funny because that shoe never was able to purchase in the United States. The uh, handball Spezial. Yeah. Maybe, like, some of the Spezial shoes, I know it's Spezial, I explained this as a line, Handball Spezial mm-hmm. is a shoe, but some, there were Handball Spezial shoes within the Spezial range. Okay. okay. Um, and some of those- Tell that to the meme makers. Yes. And there were some uh, limited versions that maybe got released at some accounts in the United States. But I saw uh, last night on- uh, Al Gore's internet. Uh, oh. <laughs> well, two, two political references in the last two minutes. Let's go, baby. Um, 2024 is right around the corner. Yeah. <laughs> but people are super hyped on one pair of the handball speciales that are set to release. This is your moment, man. There's are you a- getting them first, Team Early? <laughs> no, I'm not, because they're a, okay. they're a pair right. of they're a pair of Inter Miami, Lionel Messi's oh. team, Pink Suede. Handball speciales that are going to be dropping. And I saw that shoe get posted online, and people are all about it. Like, it's super. Sounds fun. good to me. It's Why a, don't you like it? I'm not. I'm, no, it's just crazy to see, like, the full circle moment of mm-hmm. eight years ago, people, like, laughing at you for wearing that shoe. Laughing at you. Huh. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's be specific. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then. Now it's a moment where it's like that shoe is super cool and mainstream. Joe, I want to ask you, Welty just said that the Sambas were approaching Panda Dunk levels, and I think that's relatively fair. I'm in a zone where I wouldn't wear the Panda Dunk right now just because I do think it's too saturated and rinsed, but I will still wear a GR Samba, and I very recently have been wearing GR Sambas. Joe, do you have Sambas in the rotation, or do you feel there's sufficient stigma to where you won't wear them right now i mean welty you you know you have a really good memory you you go back you talk about the phone po- the suede phone posits do you remember a couple weeks that i wore years ago years ago the original black sambas I re- it was I re- very f- i remember it was, it okay. was very well, you brief. remember there I was remember. a two-week span years ago where this man I, wore and, and one and not you know that why? special pair of shoes and oh, you remember it and you want to know why he wore it I, and i know <laughs> no, you want to know you know i know it's coming i had to know why he track pits you want to know why he wore right. it he's right what kanye west put a pair on no asap rocky did no it was cutty <laughs> oh, well, Rocky was wearing them too at the same at the, around the same time. That was reason enough for Joe LaPuma. But also, it was years ago. You know, you failed to bring that up. But I do <laughs> so uh, to your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Only the hate to your question done. I have like two almost brand new pairs from maybe four years ago. Just so OG before style, trend, white, black, and black, o- white. OG style, and one pair I wore for like two weeks straight. Our big JLP. Fear God track pants era, which was every other day, mm-hmm. and then one is still dead stock. But you had the the samba you had was this is crazy. Your memory. I remember it now though because I remember the way that Joe was walking around, careful wearing now. it. No, no, I just careful I remember now. it. There's something about the samba that just doesn't it doesn't fit the JLP walk. Okay, you need like a thicker sole on it to handle like <laughs> the the calf pressure. 
The only thing I would say about that is the tongue fuck helps it a little well, bit. Well, that, that's what I'm about to say is he, Joe had the Samba that had the longer tongue on it, not the yeah. this Originals this version that has the shorter tongue. remembers the exact length yeah. of the tongue it, on your Samba. But I got it at like a regular Adidas store. It was that's like what I'm DR. saying, but they, but they okay. made two versions of it. There's got an it, Adidas Original Samba that has like a short tongue on it, mm-hmm. and then there's the Samba that people remember from the 90s that they, ma- they made concurrently got it. that had the longer okay. tongue on it. Yeah. That kind of, it always... Curves to the side when yeah. you put it on. Yes, he's right. He's right. The tongue would always like the on the pair that I have. The tongue would always go on the side. It was it was big. Yes. Yeah, so. Another shoe from that era that I feel like I don't want to say it was a trendsetter on the Samba because mm. I don't think that the Samba is really a trendsetter thing. You know, um, regardless. But round two ended up doing this like really like random like limited run of mm-hmm. round what they called round two sport. It was just like the OG Sambas that they had found, I think, in like a, either in Germany or in the Adidas archive or something. And they just printed round two and green writing on it and then sold them to s- in small numbers. But I feel like something like that now would people would be all about it. Wait, but I, Joe, I still want to know are you going to wear Sambas in 2023, 2024? No. But uh, you guys buried the lead a little bit. We're not going to talk about the spiciness, the speech? Oh, yes. At the Footwear News Awards, yes. Mm-hmm. Adidas CEO Bjorn Golden saying to all the Nike people in the room, we've got a lot in the pipeline. And then um, who responded? Larry Miller yep. responded saying, bring it on, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. What would you guys think of that? Some nice uh, friendly competition? Not I'm so always, friendly competition? I'm always happy to see that. I'm always happy to see sneaker execs go back and forth like that. I do think that Nike would never say that to Adidas. You know, I think that Adidas is stuck in, or maybe not totally stuck in, but used to this second place or even third place mentality where you're looking at the person in first place. And I don't think that the people who are used to being in first place all the time, Mm -hmm. Nike, would ever look back at Adidas and say something like that or look at Adidas and say something like that, even when Adidas was more dominant mid-2010s. But I feel like it it goes two ways, right? Mm -hmm. Um, There's... The idea of, I think that where that run that Adidas had, I think a lot of it was caused by, uh, it wasn't just that Adidas was on a hot streak, which they were mm-hmm. at, at, the, at the point, um, 2014, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016 era, mm. but it was also, I think, spurred a lot from the mentality that Nike had at the time where you hear a lot of interviews with you know people like Tinker Hatfield where mm-hmm. they're like, I don't, I don't concern myself with trends. I'm a futurist. Mm-hmm. And it's this mm-hmm. idea of like having blinders on and not seeing anything around you. And it's not about necessarily being reactionary to stuff, but yeah. just saying no matter what I do, people are going to uh, think it's the best thing ever and not really taking into consideration mm. maybe where the market was heading. And I feel like if you look back at that pre-off-white era of nike it's just feels pretty dry to to some extent that like post red october pre yeah. off-white era there wasn't as much like hits they were doing stuff like uh Rico- suede foam posits they were doing uh back when they were doing like heavy on like giving ricardo tishi a bunch of shoes yeah. that didn't hit giving uh, olivier Rusatang uh from balmain a sneaker collaboration that was like just not good it's like they were doing a lot of stuff that just didn't work at the time yeah so mm-hmm. I don't know. They just weren't really not reacting to the market, but just not really working in their best interest. So it's mm-hmm. easy to say that we're the best, we're the shit, we're number one, and no one can f with us. And I do know that Nike is so much bigger than the other brands, but also like that doesn't like bring you away from criticism or like making bad yeah. product. I don't know. You're saying that the Rainbow ZX Flux had Nike under pressure back in the day? <laughs> oh, I mean, we had like yeah, we, had a, yeah. we had a private conversation about these Rainbow ZX Fluxes. I, I I I will never hate on the ZX Flux. Well, I, I love that moment. Here, so me, me either, but I bought I bought too many pairs and never wore. Did, wasn't there like a like a <laughs> it looked like the ocean one too? There was the a wave bunch. one was so hard. So yeah, the, the rainbow Handy one I bought two on pairs. Oh yeah, yeah. So there was a there was a discussion on the internet yeah. uh, that went around um, last week, and you know we had we've joked around a bit about you know going back to some of our old list and and re ranking them right. And one of the, the lists that came up, I think the question that originally was posed was, what was a sneaker that had a lot of buzz at the time that mm-hmm. didn't end up living up to um, the hype that had uh, been uh, 
expected for it. All, yeah. all like we've talked about on here before, like Element React 87s. Like that shoe was sneaker of the year at the Flamed time. Out. You. If you were in there in the moment, How you, dare you. you you remember it. But what did you say, Joe? <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> but it fell off. So you go to 2014 and you yeah. look at the list that we did, and I think we this is our sneaker of the year list. Sneaker of the, 2014. Sneaker of the year list. And the Red October at the time, I think, was ranked number four or six. Hey, or guys, something. Matt, I'm going to let you cook. The Red October at number four and not number one is crazy. No, no, it's not. A mistake that complex yeah, made. It is. No, no, mistake that well, complex it's made. Not, it's not, though. It's not, though. It's uh, not, are you standing by that? Yes. No, it's Also, crazy. this wasn't a big was discussion. This was too. one guy on Twitter, but go on. No, because it, 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 whatever. It, it, like, other people were talking about it. <laughs> okay, right, okay, right. okay. It, caught a, it caught a little bit of steam. But you have, I thought when you looked at it too, I was like, this is crazy. But the whole thing is that you have to put yourself back into the time. It's so easy to look at a list in 2023 and mm -hmm. say, that is stupid, right? Because things change over time. People really forget that in 2014, at the end of 2013, when Kanye said F Nike, mm -hmm. Mark Parker was talking shit. People, I'm not saying they were off Nike, but people on the Kanye bandwagon mm -hmm. were so hard team Adidas that he, when he started stepping out in Adidas shoes, that's what everyone wanted. You're that, right. That is a, and if you look at when the Red October released in early 2013, it felt like an afterthought at the time because that shoe, or 2014, sorry, and that shoe had been teased all of 2013, yeah. never came out. Kanye says, F Nike, I'm leaving, and then Nike drops the shoe out of nowhere in February. Out of nowhere, yeah. But the two years leading up to that, do you know like the amount of Air Yeezy saturation that we had in the market from the black and pink colorway? It almost became a meme at that time where we're just like, can we see like if you want to talk about the era of like off white Jordan ones becoming the ubiquitous uh like tunnel celebrity shoe? Yeah. Any artists, celebrity, people looking to get credibility, et cetera, the black and pink Yeezy 2. Pete Wentz Sig shoe. Was just like the shoe that everyone, you just got tired of it at that point. I'm not saying it's a bad shoe. I don't know though. Yeah, because it's not a bad shoe. That's what I was it's gonna say. It's not a bad I, shoe, yeah, yeah, but yeah. there was so much Air Yeezy fatigue at that point where like all the other brands are starting to make shoes in like the Air Yeezy colorway. People are making yeah. Air Yeezy Nike IDs. The Nike Inter Trainer. Yeah, like Roshi's in the, in the Air Yeezy colorway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That by the time we put the list together at the end of 2014 and Kanye was off Nike, mm -hmm. pushing Adidas, ZX Flux is effing huge. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kanye's balling up and crossing up execs in Australia in the Pure Boost. He's stepping out in it. The, yeah. the Pure Boost ends yeah. up being the predecessor to the Energy Boost and Ultra Boost, which were shoes that Kanye wore yeah. on stage. And they it, were hugely successful. It made Adidas. those shoes pop. If you, It's easy to look back and now and said, what were you guys smoking at the time when you made that list? Mm -hmm. But when you actually put yourself in the moment, I'm not saying that like, oh, it could have went the other way, yeah. right? Per se. Yeah. It's just like at the same time where it's like I remember like when the Nike Mag came out. Like yeah. when you're making the end of the year list, it's like, yeah, it may be one of the biggest shoes of the year, but like no one owned that shoe. Mm. You know? It's like no uh, nobody wore I, I, it. I think you made a good case, but I still think that's that should have been probably number one. I that we made a mistake on the list. The complex made a mistake on the list. I, 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 really, I, 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 I do, I do I don't just think so. and listen, it's a shoe that I don't own that I see a lot at the stores and like Red still October to this Yeezy day, shoes. still to this day, even guests on the show are like, this is the pair that has escaped but, but, me. But it's a lot of people's this, grills. To this day though, to this day, but we're not talking about, we're just talking about it in the context of 2014. You can't I talk still about think it was a interesting choice by us. I know that what we were trying to do. <laughs> I don't think I worked on that list by the way. <laughs> it, we weren't trolling or anything. And, and to the, all the points that you just mentioned, I could see why it ended up there. I just think. The Red October was probably number I don't think one, so. but I don't think so. I really, I really, okay. to be honest with you, in the in the time period, I really don't think so. And it's I, like I'm going to agree with Joe on this one. I I think you make good points, wealthy, and I yes. think it's important to consider these things and all things in context, especially with regards to when they released and what was big at the time, and the Red October Easy Two being the end of one chapter and the Pure Boost being the beginning of a chapter that would influence Adidas in the industry for the rest of that decade. 
But still, it's a red October Yeezy too. I just think that the, there was so much fatigue on it at the end of the year that people just were kind of tired of it at that point. All right. Well, if you okay. want to stand by the pure boost over the red October Yeezy, too. I'm just saying in the time, in the time, it made sense. It, I'm not. I don't. I'm yeah. just saying you can't look at these things now and just say, "Dude, you were stupid." Because my guest on here talks about it in in 2021 mm. is like this was so not great saying point. that. But that's what I'm you not just said. That. I think no, but I'm saying that it's still a grail for a lot of people, and I think that when you said people were over it. We're seven years. No, what are we? I get from that, that list. How many years? But it's I get still, nine years removed. Sorry, yeah, nine in, years. Nine time, years removed. But in the time period. Well, you're saying at the time period, the the year it came out, that people were over it. They're still not over it. It's nine years later. It's it, things change, man. I really feel like things when you. Talk but how about, are you saying when it released that year? It released that year. You're saying people were over it? it no was, way. It just people like, were pulling over their cars. I'm not saying. And nine years later, no, what no, no, I'm no, saying no, is, that's not, for no, my no, show, no, no, hold on, hold on, for no, my no, show, no, you, you, you no, just no, said you boiled it down to my show. No, 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 I wish you were in person. No, 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 no. Because no, because no, because no, because that year, nine years later, it still aged well. But you're. That's not what I'm saying, though. I'm talking about in the moment in 2014. I'm not even saying when the sneaker released itself. I'm talking about at the end of the year of 2014, things had changed significantly within the sneaker game. I'm not talking about. I'm not saying that the, I agree the shoe, with that. The shoe sat on shelves. I'm not saying that people didn't want it. I meant the shoe came out in February of 2014, and we're making a list in December of 2014. By the time the end of the year came around, and Kanye was already off Nike and pushing something else and everything he was wearing as the most influential person in sneakers mattered so much more that when you put together the end of the year list it felt like in that moment of December of 2014 not talking about seven years later or the lead up to it or the moment the shoe came out in December of 2014 it felt like there was fatigue on that shoe and people were more excited about what Kanye West as the most influential person in the world was doing at that moment than what had happened the year previous. Let's also let's not skip over the rest of the list where we put the fragment Jordan one criminally low. There were definitely some mistakes. I, I get it. Look, but I can also say uh, too that I feel like the fragment Jordan one oh, yes. is one of those shoes. No, that uh, that got better <laughs> with time. Yes, you're right. When but the fra- when the fragment Jordan one came out, it was not the Grail shoe that it is now. That it is now. It just is what it is. Like if you were there, you remember what it was like. Like it was a popular shoe, but Air Jordan ones weren't as big as they were a few years later at that moment. And the Fragment Jordan 1 just didn't have the buzzer hype around it that it did five years after. That's all. Mm. No. <laughs> I disagree. <laughs> what, okay, I disagree. okay, wait. wait, wait you wait, think guys, the Fragment guys, Jordan I disagree. 1 was like... No, uh, t- no I'm still talking, about, still talking about the Yeezy that people were over it uh, eight months or nine months or ten months after it dropped. And obviously no one got it, but I will disagree with that. I res- obviously respect your... Uh, Context, but I, oh, I, I, absolutely, but I do disagree that people were over it the year it dropped, and people but the, still. But nobody. But the not thing over is, it. is that nobody. The thing is that nobody wore that shoe. It's it's really hard yeah, to you like, couldn't get it exactly. So it's like, it's it, in that era of shoes. It was like these shoes were almost just like just like Nike mags. They're just like mythical things that exist on the internet. They're just like. What uh, pigeon- it's, it's hard to know how much we should consider that in in ranking a shoe at the end of the year, though. Pigeon dunks, etc. It's just they're just to me like those. They sh- don't exist to the majority. They just of our don't audience. exist. Mm. All right, g- yeah. guys. I want. I, I I'm glad yeah, we we're passionate on. about this, but I don't want to go too far into the rabbit hole on a list from nine years ago that feels kind of random because there are very pressing sneaker things happening. Yes. More recently, yes. this past week, and we're late. Couple and weeks we're late. That we want to catch up on. So there, I. I'm, I'm glad we had a spicy discussion, but let's talk about the sneakers we're wearing, and then let's get into the things we really wanted, or at least I personally really want to discuss. Yes. Wealthy, what do you have on feet? Shout out uh, the folks in Australia once again. These are the Up There store, uh, New Balance 1906. ComplexCon also coming to Australia. Australia. Joe, are we going to Australia for ComplexCon? We might. We okay. might. Yeah, we might. I got added in that trailer. I think uh, people were excited to see us maybe over there. We'll see. I'd be happy to be down under. I'm always impressed yeah. at the seemingly unlimited supply of runner collabs Wealthy has from Australian sneaker stores. I guess, <laughs> they, I guess, I guess they love me out there. Deep man. cut. It's Deep really cut. like 50 pairs on deck. They Joe, we there. can't see your feet. What are you wearing? 
reverse neon Air Max 95s. Traveled with these. And, uh, yeah. GRs for we'll the do, top G. We'll do the, we'll do the cam. The close-up nice. cam, but this is what I'm wearing. Yeah. Welty, let me know if if I'm allowed to wear these. I like that you hold people accountable. And, like, if people show up in a pair of boots <laughs> to full-size run. Literally checking. Or... Mine, I wore, I wore Merrill's. Okay. On this show. So since you wore them, I can wear This is the Merrill Moab 3. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just, it's just a joke. Merrill Moab 3. I like this model a lot. Gore-Tex. It's uh, Gore-Tex weather. So, Dunn, I'm in L.A. now. Yes. I thought maybe you would stick around. You were here last week. Yes. For the Fear of God Adidas Athletics Drop. You spent some time with Jerry. And obviously it's been all over the internet now. That drop, we've seen it. It dropped a few days ago. But what, uh, being here and, and seeing it up close, what what do you take from it? So I'm so happy that they debuted it in this grand way and really made it a spectacle. I, I love when that happens in sneakers, and I think that that helps us understand the context in which these things are meant to be understood. And just having a big launch event where that the physical space where Fear of God Athletics arrived, it was this gigantic cavernous studio in, in downtown LA and it felt like something from Dune or some sci-fi epic where there's these like monolithic structures and big concrete pillars representing the actual pillars of Jerry's brand and then these bunkers where the shoes were housed. It was interesting to talk to Jerry about the product because I mm -hmm. feel like we've heard relatively little about his Adidas work. There have been a lot of leaks and he'll comment about it on Instagram from time to time. It, he was also a little bit, I don't want to say like self-deprecating about it, but just very humble about this being the first step in what he thinks could eventually be a billion dollar business for him and Adidas. And some of these shoes we're so familiar with at this point and we've seen so much that he felt really focused already on what's next. He told me there were you know 12 to 20 shoes coming and that he has a real 100% pure performance shoe coming. I, I, I just think that I, I want to see more because what we've seen yeah. is, is stuff we've been seeing for a while now. And he even said that, you know, in terms of the weight, people people are upset about how long the weight is and kind of the way that was set up was maybe not the right decision. You just compare it to his Nike deal where he said he'd been cooking with Nike for a couple of years before they announced and then they announced and the shoes were able to come out soon after. But when it came to Adidas, the Adidas deal was announced and he hadn't been working with the brand yet at all. And then... Basically, the reason we had to wait so long for it was because yep. he was originally expected to be, Adidas wanted him to be the creative director of basketball, and then they had to shift away from that when he realized he didn't have the bandwidth to do that, yep. in addition to running Fear of God mainline, running Essentials, trying to establish Fear of God Athletics. So I'm glad it's finally here, and I'm excited to see what's next. Yeah, there was even um, a little bit of confusion, uh, I believe, last year where there was a commercial that had yeah, come out. The that, remember the why campaign. Yeah, yeah, where people thought it was a fear of God thing, and then fear of God had to put out a statement about it, yeah. and they were, they were like, was this something that Jerry, it looked very Jerry-esque, yes. so everyone's like, it, this kind of, if you were running Adidas basketball at the time, people could conceivably think that maybe this was something that you had done. Totally justified. And then, but now your name's not attached to it, so it's not Jerry Lorenzo work, so it was just, What's going on? Dunn, did he relay to you like he wants to see these on court in the NBA? What what kind of insight did he give you on that? Like, you know, Adidas basketball, I feel like throughout our careers, we've always came up on like Adidas basketball. We've seen so many hardens throughout the years. And I remember getting to complex like the Gilbert Arenas Adidas basketball regime. It's always been something that's been like kind of tough to figure out, I think. Did he relay like he wants to see these on court and, and, and what his vision was for that? The quote Jerry told me was that he wanted to make a basketball shoe where you could really go get 50 in them and then go to the club right after. And okay. he said that the Fear of God Athletics won basketball. That's the shoe that we saw at the Hollywood Bulls show mm -hmm. and then is available mm -hmm. now. He said that shoe is a little bit lifestyle leaning and not pure performance, but that the next okay. shoe that he has coming is really 100% pure performance sneaker. And we spoke about this on the show before where it was clear there was some tension there between him and Adidas or maybe maybe just a difference of opinion on what performance meant. And yeah, the Bjorn Golden had said like... Yeah, like, Adidas CEO Bjorn Golden had said mm -hmm. in the latest earnings call that they had to figure out with Jerry what the expectation was in terms of what making a performance versus a lifestyle product really means for the brand and for Fear of God Athletics. But I'm glad it's here. Joe, did you buy something from Fear of God Athletics already? I did. I got the Adelettes, the those sandals. Those are really nice. Those are really nice. Oh, what I compelled love you to those. get those? I, I love those too, but I want to hear your reasoning because people will see that and say, this is a $100 Adelette slide. Yeah. Why does this need to exist? I've had 
maybe eight pairs of Adelettes over the last six years, eight years. But I like the white and blue. I just like the white and blue clean slides. And there's probably a bunch of fear of God, not hype, but like marketing or playing into your decision, how it's presented for sure. Playing in my decision, but yeah, I, I got those right away. I'm I'm excited about those. I had a cool conversation with Jerry Lorenzo mm-hmm. about the fear of God Adelet slide, and these are the gave things you a good that, quote that make yeah. the differences to me. Yeah, where he said he knows that people will respond to it and say he just slapped his brand yeah, yeah. name on the side. It's just a regular Adelet, and he said no, this is actually the best Adelet they've ever made. And his background on it was that one day years ago. He was walking in Los Feliz and he saw Dr. Romanelli wearing a pair of Adelettes. Interesting. And he asked him, and this is, I, I love this too, because this is such a classic sneakerhead question. He just asked him, yo, where'd you get those? And Dr. Romanelli said that the pair he had on was a European version of the Adelette that they only make and sell there that is a little bit tighter and the materials on it are a little different and, and the fit is different. Mm-hmm. And we know Jerry is obsessed with fit and shape and I feel like yeah. that perspective is is one of the most valuable things he can bring to a sneaker collaboration. And Jerry said that he had his assistant buy him 100 pairs so he could wear them all the time. And he said that the Fear of God Athletics Adelet slide is based on that exact version. Well, also, we, uh, we actually spoke to Jerry about it um, and Jason Maiden, who was with Fear of God yeah. Athletics at the time, no longer, but uh, on the podcast. And we had discussed his decision on – it was one of the launch photos of when he announced the partnership with Adidas mm-hmm. that he was wearing a pair of footy socks and Adelet slides yeah. instead of a pair of sneakers. Yeah, I mean, he was like, that's just a shoe that's true to me, uh, or not a shoe, a slide, but that he wears it a lot and that he wanted it to be part of the collection. That's funny. And then, speaking of mentioning the Ultra Boost, and I feel like that's almost become Jerry's, like, he had that era, obviously, on sneaker shopping where the Y3 was, like, his signature uh, sneaker at the time, the black and white pair. Wearing those a lot. Yeah, and now he's wearing the Ultra Boost. I think it's, like, a white and green pair that's, like, Yeah, he's his. been wearing his signature look. With yeah, the, he with had those on that day at the Fear of God Athletic Did you Atmosphere ask Space. You ask him about the designing uh, outfit. I, like, <laughs> remember I, my suggestion, the LV Supreme, yeah. when he's in that mode? You I didn't, didn't get a chance. Okay. They, they cut me off for time. <laughs> I was getting every question I possibly could in there, Joe, but I didn't get a chance to ask your question. I'm sorry. Real quick, though, to put a pin in that Adelette conversation, like that – Means everything, you know what yes, I mean. But Dr. Romanelli, know, that means I everything. Know people are going to criticize it and feel like the the it's price gouging and things like that, and that he is just slapping that on, and that's not enough to to justify the difference. But isn't this why we're here to appreciate the subtle differences in, in sneakers and footwear design? Isn't this why we like this yeah. stuff to to care about the difference between Nike Air versus Jumpman? To care about the shape of a toe? To care about the fit of a pair of slides? And I'm not here to apologize for Jerry, just relaying our conversations about the designs. But those things make a difference, and that's cool to me. And I'm, Joe, I'm glad to hear that you bought them and and, and felt some way about them. It's history, baby. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I do think it's important to like put it all into context and like because i know there was a lot of discussion online about the prices yeah of yeah fear of god um the adidas line because yeah, fear of god athletics maybe there was some sort of confusion with some consumers who are much more familiar with uh with the essentials line mm-hmm. who that really thought that this was just going to be like essentials adidas or maybe at that like price point, mm. and not realizing that Fear of God itself is more so a luxury brand. The main um, line. Yes. So it's going to bring almost that level of pricing, maybe not to that extreme. Somewhere in between. Um, and a lot of people are looking for something to replace Yeezy for them, because obviously that's not a thing, or currently a thing with that, uh, with Adidas. But it's not like Yeezy shoes were cheap, you know? It's, sure, yeah. it's, I'm not saying that, Everything's justifiable um, mm-hmm. with pricing, uh, with fear of God, but I don't know. I, I feel like he got like a lot of like criticism the past week where there was a 2019. It wasn't an interview; it was like a conversation that he had with uh, Pastor Stephen Furtick at Elevation Church. Which, just for disclosure, I'm like friends with a lot of people mm-hmm. there and talk to them on a regular basis. So not just like apologizing for them, but just throwing that out there. Yeah. And, 
he was discussing kind of his uh, his work process. Yeah. He, the The gist of it was that he has been called to create these great things. He feels like God didn't create him to to make mediocrity. He's like, I made these high level ideas that are expensive to create. So it's like I did, wasn't called to make something for a cheap price. So mm-hmm. people were trying to roast Jerry online for saying that. God called him to make Fear of God Athletics a certain price point. Where I don't think that that's really like the the point he was getting across. I think it's more so in the lines of people can laud someone like Fat Joe for saying yesterday's price is not today's price. And that's like the mantra he lives his life by, right? And then you take someone like Fat Joe, who's also a person of faith. So it's like his inspiration is coming from essentially the same way, if that's his worldview, not to make this about religion or anything, but it's like if Jerry has the same out view that he's been called to do great things and that this is how expensive they are to make and someone like Fat Joe can say it and it's okay, I just don't understand the, where the line gets cross where what Jerry said where he feels like he has was given the the ability to create high level ideas and yeah. they're not cheap to make that why he gets roasted for them and other people like yeah go off that's what we live by you know mm, mm. that that's just what I've been wrestling with them in, in my head about it a lot lately but I'm just like oh man and a lot of people were hitting me up because they were confused that they thought that that interview was talking about fear of god athletics and him talking about the price point on that so there was like this weird signals Got getting it. getting crossed on it but it is interesting because some of that stuff tops out at some of the more expensive mm-hmm. items adidas has ever released there are italian made bags in there that cost like fifteen hundred dollars and i do understand oh, wow. why yeah. people would see an adidas bag for fifteen hundred dollars and have questions about it i think that's justified too no i, I get it but what would you expect like yeah. you know the retail on something like that to be and I get it, and I also get that some people would be like, I would never buy a sandal for $100. I, mm-hmm. I do get that. That's I do fair. get that. But I'm, I'm looking forward to what's next, and I'm glad that they shifted the nature of their partnership. Jerry also told me, quote, I never wanted to creative direct anything other than fear of God, but it sounded really interesting because I thought the rest of the basketball division needed help, unquote. And I think that his talents are better served in a broader way, making athletic wear rather than just basketball. And also – Adidas has new talent in the basketball division now. Nathan Van Hook, who yeah. tied together, designed the Nike Air Yeezy 2 mm-hmm. at Nike and was later at Montclair for a brief period. Now is Adidas' VP of basketball design. So, And Adidas has a new CEO. It's a new Adidas versus when Jerry signed there three was years the, ago. There was also confusion online, which I guess there's confusion about everything. And the fact that he named it Fear of God Athletics – People were expecting Jerry Lorenzo to essentially design like Under Armour or Nike tech fleece Mm. that look cool. Well, I mean, I don't think that that's like that far off. And he said he wants it to be pure performance product. Like he wants this to be the performance pillar of his brand. So Mm -hmm. I think those expectations are not unfair. Are we going to see you in like those visor sunglass? (laughs) I don't think they sell the visors. No. You might see me in some fear. Are you, are you buying any Fear of God athletics? Uh, you know what? I On first examination, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the shoes maybe weren't as much for me, but I kind of do like that shoe. Is, is it the 86? 86 low, yeah, based on the rivalry. Yes, I like that one. I thought maybe I would like the shoe based off of the Adidas uh, Los Angeles trainer. Yeah. Um, Adidas Los Angeles trainer is a shoe that I just like. Yeah. But something about that one doesn't do it for me. Um, I feel like maybe there's too much product in the market that looks like that. Looks like that. That I know. I get where Jerry's coming from. Yeah. His, his spending time in the archives and him being in Los Angeles, this being the Adidas Los Angeles. Turning Makes sense. It, turning cool it, connection. I don't think maybe that one hit as much. 86 low looks almost, ah, man, I, I don't want to say this, but say it, say it. It looks like an elevated 550. Okay. The reasoning he gave me for its design was that, and that shoe he said had been designed for two years and Mm -hmm. was a product of when he was still focused on basketball. And so Mm -hmm. they gave him this retro basketball shoe to redo. And he wanted to make kind of his own version of an Air Force One, but with a sleeker shape and a toe that could better suit him because he said he felt like he could never really wear Air Force Ones because they would always give him that bozo toe, that bulbous look up front. And the 86 low was his way to challenge that and to make a similar silhouette retro basketball sneaker from the 80s and have it be 
more fitting for him where he could look a little bit more chic in it. And we could, let's uh, rewind the tape a little bit and go back because I remember we had a conversation about it uh, beforehand where I was like, you know what would make a lot of sense for Adidas to make a ton of money is if they took uh, a rivalry or Adidas Continental and let Jerry Lorenzo put his touch on it. You said that on this podcast? Yes. All right. Before, I believe you. I believe you. Oh, wow. Before we saw Stamped the product. It. I believe you. Before it. we saw the product, and I didn't know anything about it. Nice work. Sweet's listening. <laughs> okay, we have to get to the biggest yes. topic. We, we we did kind of bury the lead here, but this is the biggest thing happening at Sneakers, and yep. we apologize for being late on it. We had mm-hmm. recorded some episodes, and news broke. Yep. I wrote about it. We're here to talk about it. It's it's the biggest scandal this year. We we Every year needs a big sneaker scandal, and I feel like we were kind of without one before the year expired. Maybe Tom Sachs kind of getting dumped by Nike quietly was the biggest one so far. That, but yeah, that one feels like it. People almost for like not forgot about what had uh, transpired with yeah. there, but it just feels so long ago that you're like, oh wow, that happened this year. Came and went in a way, but we want to talk about James Whitner, owner of Social Status and Amal Manier, alleged to be running a 32 million dollar sneaker resale scheme. This is according to a civil forfeiture complaint filed in North Carolina District Court. This is from a few weeks back, basically alleging that he has for years been reselling sneakers to Chinese nationals and that the business is tied up into this money laundering operation that rinses dirty money and brings it back to James Whitner. Not that he is the source of the dirty money, but it's it's a complicated scheme so where like the money gets like pitched off to almost like yeah, you know, and people it, in New York City and then they yeah, will collect the cash. A lot of layers. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the the important thing or one of the important things to mention up top is there are no criminal charges against James Whitner. This is a civil forfeiture complaint having to do with $2 million that was seized from an apartment a few years ago in this investigation. From an alleged partner of his? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy Hutch, a- Antoine Freeman, who was, was also alleged to be involved in this in this business. Um, U.S. Attorney's Office is basically saying that, that there's this guy in China named YG. They just call him YG in the complaint. And that not YG, the not the rapper. Not yet, yes. Yeah. <laughs> YG was the guy buying the sneakers in China and there was a broker, a middleman, and and the middleman was in charge of kind of transferring the money from one end of the transaction to the other end of the transaction. And that this middleman, this broker, would direct money couriers Mm -hmm. to collect cash and that cash would then go to James Whitner in exchange for the sneakers that he was selling allegedly to this person in China. We don't know what the sneakers are. We don't know if he was unloading the bad stuff or Just unloading the good stuff. Just selling White Air Force Ones. Or, yeah. You don't, I'm not, there or are a lot of details we don't energy. know. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, I have so many, many thoughts about this. Um, the most interesting thing to me is whether or not Nike will continue to work with James Whitner. In the statement, though, it seems like it was explicitly that the vendors are sticking by social status, right? Yes. So Whitner gave us a comment about this. It's a long comment. But one of the things he said was, we disagree with the U.S. Attorney's Office allegations concerning our business and remain appreciative of the extraordinary support of our vendor partners that have shown and continue to show through this process. The complaint alleges that Whitner, by reselling sneakers in this way, broke the rules of the contract set up with unnamed footwear company based in Oregon. That's obviously Nike. We can say that pretty conclusively. So if he did break that contract and and sell this amount of sneakers, Mm -hmm. resell them, which is, which is not allowed by Nike. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, There are so many people we know in stores we know who quietly have lost their Nike accounts or have been penalized by Nike for doing much, much less. And it, it's it's got to be a little bit upsetting for those yeah. or people in the retail business who sell sneakers and have to pay rent to know that a different standard is being applied uh, to to James Whitner if he really is reselling this many millions of dollars worth sneakers than to skate shops who might lose their account over putting a couple pairs on eBay or selling shoes early. Yeah, I I mean in the past uh, I've always kind of heard stories about you know people who are high volume resellers and say a Yeezy comes out, mm. right? And a reseller is going to buy, a, you know, a hundred pairs or 50 pairs yeah. or whatever from a retailer that maybe gets a thousand pairs or something. Straight like that. back dooring. Straight back dooring. Which Straight- this happens. Yes. yes every yes, retailer, yes. like Everywhere. almost every retailer does this. This yes. is widespread. So essentially what the setup is, is that say hype shoe comes out, uh, Ye- Yeezy 350 releases. I want 80 pairs of it to resell. 
what you do is then you go there and then there's a bunch of other stuff at the store, the stuff that isn't selling and the retailer will say, if you want the hundred pairs of Yeezys, you got to take the 200 pairs of Reebok Club C's Mm -hmm. or just insert like shoe that they have so much stock of that, Mm -hmm. you know, they can't, they can't shift at the point. And I've heard retailers say to some extent that that's just how the business works these days. Mm-hmm. The, what that happens is the brands make you buy these minimums. Sure. Where it's like you need to spend, I don't, I'm just throwing magic numbers out there, $2 million per uh, season on this. And you want, you've already purchased, you've already done all your allocated purchasing from the company, but you still have. $20,000 left to spend. So you have to pick up a bunch of product that you know you can't sell, but they won't give you the bulk of everything until you fill out the $20,000 that are that are missing. So now you're almost stuck with yeah. this whole it, end of it's it. It's a lot. If you want the heat product, you have to take a bunch of other product that everyone knows and, is and not look going it, to sell. It's almost like on both sides now, right? So it's like Nike saying, if you want the heat product, you got to take the crap product. So yeah. then the retailer is saying to the reseller, if you want the heat product, you got to take the crap product. And this isn't me uh, giving any sort of uh, apologizing for James. You know, I don't know if he did or did not do anything that mm-hmm. is being alleged. He hasn't been convicted. Nor even charged. Yeah, of any of this. So, because I know people out there were trying to say, oh, you guys won't talk about this. You know, you have connections with all these people because he's been on the show that, you know, you're 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 too much into your industry connects to say anything about this process, which I'm like, dude, go screw yourself. Um, yeah, I mean, look, th- those people always have those criticisms, but I feel like on this show we've always held people accountable. We talked about Marcus Jordan backdooring in depth and haven't really wavered in that stance. When Joey Bear popped off, people felt like we wouldn't be critical of Nike for that. We were in depth, and you know. When this news broke, I stayed up until 3 a.m. Yeah. writing through the civil forfeiture complaints about what happened. So I don't really care about whether or not people feel like we went hard enough or dunked it. But I feel like you on. did – my take is you did the responsible thing. Um, yeah, but people just, want, people just want you to dunk on people or shit on people but, and, and but celebrate it, that something seems to have gone terribly right with their business, which seems to be the case here, but – we're but, just going to stick to the facts but and I think give our opinions here. Reporting the piece, getting the statement from James, putting out the news. So I feel like if you're someone on the Internet who mm-hmm. wants to know what happened, it's much better to just read a story that tells you exactly what happened instead of having to wade through a bunch of memes and opinion pieces. But, and Yeah, that's Internet culture, though. You know that that's always going to happen. I, I see what you're saying. I understand what you're saying, obviously, for a very serious kind of allegation like this. But the knee-jerk reaction, you know, it's going to go very wide on social media. Dunn, do you think the Nike relationship and what happens there is the biggest part of this besides the potential criminal charges? For me, that's the biggest part, and that's the most interesting part, because James Whitner and his mm-hmm. businesses, Social Status and Ama Manier, are some of the biggest, if not the biggest, partners Nike has in terms of collaborators. This guy is going to do a ton of sneakers with Nike next year. They have a lot planned. Air Max 95, Jordan shoes, Jordan game shoes, a lot of projects in the works. So if you're Nike and you see this, you have to make the decision whether or not you will continue to work with this person if it is in fact the case that they are reselling millions of dollars worth of sneakers overseas and involved in what an IRS investigator is calling an illegal money laundering business. I think Nike is going to stand by him. I don't have this concrete right now, but based on what I'm hearing, Nike is sticking with James Whitner on this, and I don't think they'll change that position unless it becomes a criminal matter for him. I think that this happens a lot with Nike where they have to consider how much they're already invested in someone and how many resources they already have dedicated and how much work it would be to undo those relationships or steer that ship in a different direction. And I don't think they're going to do that with him just yet. I also think that James Whitner has the ear of the top people at Nike. We know he's close with Michael Jordan. You think that makes him like bulletproof? I don't think extent? it makes him bulletproof, but he I just ha- think... But he has- Definitely relationships with very, very powerful people there. Yeah, I don't think it's a stretch to say that the execs know who James Whitner is and know why they value him and appreciate the business he's brought them and also what he's done for them as a black collaborator and a black-owned business, bringing 
that type of energy to Nike, which they were missing. I, I, I think it's just a question of like who is going to hold him accountable if he did do these things. And it brings me back to the Marcus Jordan situation of when that happened, we were happy to come on here and talk about it. And, and we feel like we have that responsibility to hold him accountable. And the sneakerhead community, quote unquote, is going to hold him accountable and, and, and say, hey, how can this happen? But who within the brand is going to raise the questions of should we still be working with this person? Why are we still working with this person? And I don't think that there are people who are really going to do that. I think that that's, that's the question, right? Because we've definitely seen in the past where Nike has severed ties. Yeah with collaborators mm-hmm. and it's they're for a whole host of reasons sure. right and i feel like it it essentially comes down to what the reason is that you're that you're severing ties with them yeah and i mean i don't know cuz obviously i don't work at nike but i would have to guesstimate to some extent that the reason to sever ties has somewhat to do with what the opinion is on campus mm-hmm. around mm-hmm the negative situation that occurs. If it's a situation that people feel strongly about and they're like pressing their bosses about like, why are we working with this guy? He says things that I don't agree with, et cetera, et cetera. Then I feel like Nike may be much more prone to saying, hey, you you know what? Kyrie Irving, you're out of here, right? But James Whitner, as much as like people may be frustrated by this, I feel like what uh, allegedly transpired isn't, one of those sort of issues that's going to rile up a stir feels less like a moral question on campus yeah i get the sense that people aren't asking those questions right now and maybe they're not interested in it and also like you have to wonder whether or not nike is willing to slow down a business that has been as successful as james whitner's where if he's helping them metabolize 32 million dollars worth of product over Mm -hmm. a six-year span according to this complaint that's not a huge portion of Nike's business, but that's like a lot of people's jobs who are tied up in that amount of revenue. And it's the same thing that we've talked about before when it comes to backdooring where like a sales rep who is helping Ama Manier and Social Status get shoes doesn't necessarily want to be the one to cut them off and and have all this allocation go away and and be responsible for less revenue for Nike. And if, if, if Nike at the top believes in what James Whitner is doing, and also if he is reselling these sneakers, I don't think that erases the positive things he's done or they've made a lot of great shoes. And also, like, I still think that the programming they do in terms of the uh, free game sessions, I think those are still valuable things for people. And I think they've done a lot of charitable work in that regard that is still laudable, whether or not he really is involved in this massive resell ring. How long do you think this process will take now? And it seems like it also started in 2021, so it wasn't a surprise to James. Yeah, it wasn't a surprise to James. This has been going on for a while. The The cash was seized a while back, and this is just like the latest step and the first one that's been made really public and connected back to him. But yeah, people were arrested. Two of these Chinese money couriers, I'm only saying they're Chinese because the IRS makes a big deal in the complaint about calling out who it is and isn't yeah. Chinese, but two of the guys who were involved in this money courier aspect of the business, they were arrested. Also, they, they make this thing spicy by saying that the people who were getting the money and funneling it back, they were getting the money from people involved in like sex work and narcotics. Mm-hmm. I understand why you would write that in a complaint, but I don't really think you can put that on James Whitner. Like if, if I'm if I'm selling a pair of shoes to somebody and I get the cash from them, you know, just a you know, on the street, you know, if I meet up with somebody off of Facebook and I'm selling them shoes and they give me the cash and then later on I find out that that cash was obtained illegally or had to do with drug money, it's like I d- I don't really know if that's well, fair to like pin that is, on. Isn't there always kind of that like narrative? And I don't know how much of it's true or mm-hmm. not because it's not something I've deeply researched myself, but I've definitely have seen it out there where it's like. And this is reselling, so it's different, but mm-hmm. it's like when you buy fake or counterfeit goods, yeah. you're like supporting terrorism in the drug trade and, and yeah, whatnot. I, I, I think it's a thing that the government will do sometimes to make these things seem more dramatic or make them seem more like moral issues. And I don't think it's unbelievable and it's certainly possible, but mm-hmm. I'm not going to put that on James Whitner. Well, so what I think is interesting, too, is that this comes at a very uh, interesting um, uh juncture in, in time because the Amon Manier Air Jordan 5s mm-hmm. just came I out. I thought the same. I So I thought the same. Did they drop 
after this came out or yeah, right yeah. before? So they yeah, can, right after. And it, they, and, and it didn't, they didn't pause that release at they all. They didn't so, pause it, but if you look through the comments, people are upset very negative. And a lot very of negative. people have not gotten okay. their sneakers or were charged. And so it may have wrinkled the business a little bit, but I asked Amma Manier and they said, we're moving forward with them yeah. as planned, but they're there, getting roasted. There were, yeah, there, were a, lot of, there yeah. were a lot of comments saying, I won the raffle. How come I haven't gotten a response or any sort of shipping tracking information mm -hmm. and confirmation for the shoes I paid for in X amount of hours done to your point about seeing if Nike's going to stick by them for now they it are is, it well it is interesting that they came out after and there was no pause on the release I, yeah. I, feel I, like, I, I think I think not even two weeks back like scheduled no pause at all yeah I think it's interesting because there's just it feels like people are upset about maybe not getting the confirmation mm -hmm. on it per se, but it doesn't feel like there's as much personal animus towards James Whitner or mm. Amma Meunier where it's like, I feel like uh, a good a good example, this is um, has nothing to do with what happened with James, but a year ago with Travis Scott, right? Where it's like Nike had to put that relationship on pause when all the, the aftermath of the Astro World situation came mm. out. And there were people at the time who were like, I don't think I can wear a Travis Scott shoe. I don't want to wear this. They're yeah. not saying F Travis Scott, maybe not, but they just didn't want to align with the product at the time. But you just don't get that same feeling of. Yeah. But it's interesting to me, though, because this feels like the sort of thing that people on the sneaker internet are most upset about yeah. right where it's like oh you're resell you're backdooring shoes you're the reason that raffles are unfair you're mm -hmm. the reason why i can't get sneakers etc cetera, etc cetera. that you would think that the way that people talk online at least on the sneaker internet that they would almost be more upset about um mm -hmm. uh negative situation than the moral questions you know, that get proposed that yeah. they're canceling sneaker collaborators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I think one of the other things that feels disingenuous now in hindsight and that is frustrating is to know that, and we have one comment from James Whitner on this, and I hope we can talk about it with him more in depth mm -hmm. in the future. Yeah. I, I suspect he'll be reticent to, but Amma Minier, Social Status have been public about what they say are their efforts to release sneakers in a fair, equitable manner. Sure. And I think that they've done a good job of that. And from my perspective, they have, you know, but all that stuff feels disingenuous now when you're being told that, in fact, he's reselling millions of dollars a year worth of shoes to a reseller in China. And again, we don't know if this is the high heat shoes or the crap shoes, mm -hmm. but he came on here and told us, and a lot of people criticized this figure immediately afterward, that they're spending half a million dollars on a launch. People who Bot protection. Yeah, right? people who know how those launches work told me that's like not really an accurate figure at all, but it's like was that all for show or or is that still the case to some extent i just don't know how to look back on those statements i i, I think it's interesting too because another good example i guess to to compare this to is you know a couple years ago marcus jordan trophy room air jordan ones mm. right where a lot of people yourself included mm. on the internet believe that he backdoored the shoes at a mass rate right in that totally uh malign that sneaker and him to a huge degree in in the public perception right with Amma Meunier, it's allegedly a very similar thing is being uh brought up against him in, in fact on a way bigger scale the problem is that you don't have a we don't have a specific example of what was being backdoored we what don't know if it is. was air force ones or Amma Meunier jordan threes you, you think know? if a it was tied to a shoe would be even more chatter yes for sure and i think that's what people want to know is, is what is this product is it the good stuff is it stuff we don't really care about yeah. I, also when we had james on this podcast most recently july 2022 we asked him about backdooring and and how prevalent that was at sneaker boutiques and he said quote i've had very candid conversations about the need for some stores to backdoor pairs i'm not about to tell nobody who's mm -hmm. late on their rent not to do what they got to do to make your rent he said then that the first responsibility is making sure you take care of your family. If you have to sell some shoes in order to help you pay rent, then you're going to sell those shoes. I mean, I think we just have to be honest here about the fact that this does happen at, yeah. at many, many retailers. And also, though, if I'm one of the people, the business owners who owns or runs one of those other sneaker stores, I would be upset about this because I would say, hey, 
how come Nike is not holding this person accountable to the standard that I'm being held accountable to? If there's a complaint out there from a government agency, from an IRS investigator saying that this person did this over a span of years, there's millions of dollars involved, China's involved, drug money is involved, then why do I have to be as careful as I can to not break these rules if somebody else is doing it in a way that seems now very public and flagrant? I, I, I think that it will affect how those people do their business. And I think that there are a lot of people who own sneaker stores who are gonna be way more careful now about how they back door shoes, how they get this product out into the secondary market yeah. without becoming the target of an investigation. It's the whole like uh, the rules for ye, not for the situation mm. where it's like, maybe because like you had said that James like ticks more boxes for Nike with like partnership programs yeah. and messaging and you know uh, what the brand wants to represent yeah. on a larger scale where he's such a more influential partner, not just beyond giving him a shoe and being yeah. able to sell units. It's something that they want to build their business around. Yeah. And obviously the connections to the company that you said that potentially it's like, if you're just a tier zero account in the middle of America that yeah. sells cool shoes, but you're never going to get a collaboration if not you do. part of larger Nike brand strategy. Yeah, and you're not stores stores fight to get that Nike account. It means everything to them. But if they're not going to get those big partnerships, they're not going to be strategic to Nike getting out what the corporate values are. Mm -hmm. Then they might get hit over the head if they get caught doing the same thing. Yeah, and they have, and they, they it, it happens all the time. Obviously, a story that's going to keep developing and i'm not sure what exactly where it goes next but i mean i think nike will carry on with its relationship with him unless this turns into yeah. a criminal manner that's my prediction mm -hmm. that's not based on you know too many conversations that i've had with people or any advanced knowledge of what's going on I, i'm just curious and i don't know how this is gonna what the true financials are are about it and i'm just wondering that if this all goes through mm -hmm. and there's millions and millions of dollars involved in it mm -hmm. does it have the potential to not just the perception of what's going on with nike does it have the potential to sink his companies i i, I can't make that prediction i, yeah. I don't know yeah but, i mean it could be a big question mark in the future you know with how much money the government wants to yeah 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 if, if they bring charges against him again yeah. this is not a yeah. criminal matter not not no criminal charges for james whitner in this yeah, I look forward to seeing how it plays out. Um, I hope we can learn more through the court documents that are available. I, I yeah. hope, you know, like I said, I hope we can talk to James Whitner here on the show about it because I do think we have a responsibility to try and hold those people accountable. Again, all these things are alleged, but we want to know the answers to this and we'll do our best to pursue them. Absolutely. All right, I feel like we got through everything. We, we longer yeah, podcast. Pr pretty much. I could I could talk about the I could talk about the social status thing and uh, all the alleged reselling for hours. And when it first broke, I was on the phone with everybody all day long. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm glad we got to talk about it here, and I'm sure we'll be talking about it plenty more in the future. We we only have a couple more episodes to go for the through the end of the year, right? We got to get to like sneaker yeah. of the year combo. That's another spicy yeah, one. That's exactly that's one that's right now the the, the complex comp panel, and they're all in the comments. So we're definitely gonna do our take. <laughs> Definitely going to do our take on on that panel. Should we just Is do like next? our own favorite sneak? I feel like we've gone through the list in the years past, and people have been more interested in us being passionate about the shoes that we actually like rather than the stuff we compromise. Oh, I, I think we should defend list. our we should defend our list, and then maybe bring three to five each that are okay. personal favorites. That could be okay. good. One thing I one thing I need I do need to bring up because uh, this was sneaker of the year last year, and it did transpire over Thanksgiving. I have no idea what this is. Nearly one year later, uh, there was a huge discussion last year between myself and Brendan Dunn about one, be it the Stray Rats, New Balance 580s. <laughs> I was, yes, I was going hard for the New Balance MT580 Stray Rats collaboration, a shoe still that, love that people of good taste in general, like Joe LaPuma and myself, and really appreciate. And the discussion basically centered around me saying that I think it would be okay if you put it on your personal top 10 year of the list, but objectively speaking, it cannot be considered as a top 10 sneaker of the year because there are much other New Balance shoes that are better and were bigger. And we would have got fried if we had put those yes. on our top 10 but list. But full circle moment, I'm visiting my folks <laughs> in New Hampshire. Go up Do you to, know about this, Joe? Go up to Maine. Yeah, they yes, were so, outlet, right? <laughs> go, go, go up to oh, the sorry. outlets, New Balance outlets in 
Kittery, Maine, and they had full size runs, RIP, uh, of both colorways sitting there at the New Balance Outlet. Not saying that that's uh, a depiction of if it's a good shoe or not. Yeah, a true it, reflection of its value. Yeah, but one year later, it was seemed like. Um, like you were right now. Yeah, wrong. that history uh, put me in the right light. What if you saw a pure boost at the outlets? Hey, man. Mm. <laughs> I, love, like the, I love that like straight shoes, right? <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe, and um, only Joe for supporting me. All right, listen. Another week. Glad that we got to catch up. Will you be back next week, Joe? Can uh, we do this I hope person? so. Will we I see hope your so. I, face here in the studio with I us? hope so. I hope so. I hope to be back next week. We'll see where these... Uh, these filming shows take me though back to gravedigger mountain <laughs> maybe maybe <laughs> all right everyone this has been the complex sneaker show we hope everyone has a great weekend please like subscribe we will see you next week